Our first presenter is Faye Hartman. She is the Conservation Director with the Colorado River Basin Program for American Rivers. And today she will, be present, she will present findings from American Rivers Report, Rivers as Economic Engines. Hi there, my name is Faye Hartman and I'm the Conservation Director for American Rivers Colorado River Basin Program. American Rivers is a national river conservation organization that's focused on protecting wild rivers, restoring damaged rivers, and conserving clean water for people and nature. A big thank you to Rivers Edge West for hosting this conference and to all of you for joining us today. I'm really excited to be a part of the Restoration Economy panel, and I hope you enjoy the presentations from Molly, Todd, and myself, and the discussion that we'll have at the end. Today I'll be talking with you about one of American Rivers' most recent reports, Rivers' Economic Engines, where we make the economic and jobs-based case for investing in equitable and innovative water infrastructure and healthy rivers. In addition to covering the report, I'm also going to talk about the importance of public funding at all levels, federal, state, and local, and provide a couple of examples um, from here in Colorado where communities have come together to develop and raise public funds for river health and restoration projects. Before we get into the specifics of our Rivers' Economic Engines report, I want to provide a little bit of background information about it. Our report compiled existing economic and jobs information about the benefits of healthy rivers and clean water to support important policy and funding recommendations that we make in the report. Our report makes policy and funding recommendations in the following areas. Improve water infrastructure, modernize flood management, and restore watersheds in our communities. We also make recommendations that <clears throat> um, funding that any any funding for rivers and water infrastructure must also be equitably distributed among communities and projects that have been previously underinvested in and need it most. And we also provide recommendations on ways to look at this. Um, we all know that rivers and clean water are smart investments that contribute significantly to economic growth and job creation. From this infographic, you can see some of the national level statistics. By investing in water infrastructure, we can create over a million sustainable jobs. The river recreation industry supports over a million and a half jobs. Over 225,000 workers are employed in the ecological restoration space, which includes watershed and river restoration, and that's a, a very significant contributor to um, the annual economy. And then finally, the natural infrastructure space, so those solutions that protect, restore, and mimic um, our natural river systems, and so things like restoring wetlands and reconnecting rivers to their floodplains, um, employ millions of people every year, and this number is um, expected to grow by 5%. And during this presentation, I'm going to give um, a brief overview of the improved water infrastructure and modernized flood management sections, but I'm really going to spend more time on the restore watersheds in our communities section. So the first uh, area that we focus on in our report is improved water infrastructure. Our, the United States water infrastructure is crumbling. Um, the American Society of Civil Engineers gave the United States drinking water a D and our wastewater infrastructure a D plus. And the, and the US Water Alliance also found that over 2 million Americans lack running water, indoor plumbing or wastewater treatments. And um, to address these really serious challenges facing our country, we recommend increasing funding to improve water infrastructure, to ensure that water is assess accessible and available for everyone, and to prioritize green infrastructure solutions, um, uh, among other recommendations that we go into more detail in our report. And you can find that in this particular section. By investing in our water infrastructure, we create jobs. We stimulate local economies while also address really significant issues that have been facing our country and local communities for decades. Water infrastructure improvements also have many other benefits, public health, social and environmental benefits, green infrastructure, um, so like green um, uh, rain gardens and green roofs help to cool down the temperature of communities, they reduce stormwater runoff, and they provide ample green space while absorbing air pollution um, and providing habitat for local uh, wildlife. A quick example of, um, of how of one, one community in particular has kind of seen improvements from um, 
from upgrading their water infrastructure is Philadelphia. In 2011, the city um, launched their Green City Clean Waters program, which injected over a billion dollars in public funding to reduce stormwater pollution um, in Philadelphia by 85%. In 2019, the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia found that this program produces $4 billion in total economic impact um, for Philadelphia, and about um, 1,160 jobs annually are focused on these types of um, uh, water infrastructure improvements. And there was also a savings of $50 million annually in avoided health-related cost, um, thanks to people's improved access to open space. The second area that we focus on is modernizing flood management. Over 40 million people across the United States live in floodplains, and unfortunately, many of them rely solely on traditional flood control structures that can make um, that can make matters worse by passing problems downstream and perpetuating this flood damage repair cycle that has really significant and devastating costs to life, to property, taxpayers, and to the environment as well. You know, we need a new, more resilient approach to our flood management, one that considers natural infrastructure and nature-based solutions like reconnecting floodplains and restoring wetlands, an approach that promotes public safety and restores the rivers that flow through our communities. And the good news is that these approaches also create jobs that will help to get our and will help to get our economy back on track. The ecological restoration sector, um, which, like I said earlier, includes floodplain restoration, um, river restoration, and nature-based solutions, directly employs over 125,000 workers and supports an additional almost 100,000 workers um, in, uh, indirectly. So that's where that 226,000 jobs comes up. And it contributes $25 billion to the economy annually. Additionally, the Pacific Institute found that on average, a $1 million investment in either river restoration or um, remediation generates between 10 and 72 jobs, depending on the type of project that you're looking at um, uh, in terms of the restoration project. To help transform uh, our current flood management approach into a more resilient model, we've recommended a host of policy improvements and funding solutions that include things like climate resiliency planning, encouraging funding and implementing nature-based solutions, doing a better job of integrating the work of agencies at the state, the federal, and the local level so they work collaboratively together on flood management issues. Doing this, we can make communities more resilient while also employing Americans across the country. And again, more specific recommendations are available in the report. A great example of the um, economic and environmental benefits that natural infrastructure has um, for communities was on the Cache River in southern Illinois. Um, in 2008, the Fish and Wildlife Service released a report that studied um, the economic impact of a 10-year wetland restoration project. They found that you know this $10 million 10-year project um, of the restoration project of the river and the associated wetlands generated you know over 36 jobs. Um, uh, for each one million dollars that were invested, and in total, you know, over twelve million dollars um, in total economic output was generated over that time period. And you know, this project was not only good economically for the region and for the the state and communities, but also protected and revitalized a really unique ecosystem um, in this area that provides immense benefits for the local community in the form of flood control, water quality improvement, and of course, wildlife habitat. I think all of us can agree that rivers are the lifeblood of local communities. We can revitalize rural, suburban, and urban communities by restoring lands and waters, improving our agricultural practices, and building um, recreational amenities so people can access um, our amazing um, open spaces, uh, lands, and waters. River restoration, recreation, and agricultural improvements also create jobs. Um, 
The University of Oregon found that uh, every $1 million that's spent on watershed restoration generates an average of 16 new or sustained jobs and up to $2.5 million in total economic activity. So that's a pretty big return on investment for that million dollars. Moreover, investment benefits the local communities where those projects um, are taking place. 80% of restoration project funds stay in the county where projects are located. Agricultural efficiency improvements also benefit the economy. They benefit the agricultural productivity, and they also um, have significant improvements for the environment. The Pacific Institute found that when a million dollars is invested in agricultural efficiency, on average, 15 jobs are created. And for those of us, I think most of us that live in the Intermountain West, I think we can all appreciate um, that recreation has and continues to drive significant economic growth and job development for communities across the region. The Outdoor Industry Association's National Recreation Economy Report found that water sports and fishing um, have, create over 1.5 million jobs nationwide. And I know Molly is going to talk um, here shortly about the economic benefits of river-based recreation in Colorado. So stay tuned for that as well. And as I mentioned earlier, the natural infrastructure is in infrastructure sector is growing. We have the opportunity to create even more jobs by investing um, in natural infrastructure solutions and implementing those projects on the ground. The policy recommendations that you see on your screen here will help to improve um, and, and restore our watersheds that uh, at the same time, creating new jobs, uh, revitalizing local economies, and reviving the ecosystems that we all rely on. By investing um, uh, in the policy recommendations that you see on the screen, like integrated water management plans, we can protect existing and future water uses while supporting and improving our rivers. By developing a 21st century co civilian conservation corps, we can restore rivers, their surrounding lands, and recreational access while also increasing jobs and stimulating the economy. And by providing more funding for restoration, we can revitalize communities, their economies, and the watersheds that really support those, um, those places. As restoration practitioners, I think we all know that restoration not only improves um, our rivers and the local quality of life, but it also revitalizes the local economy. I want to share a couple of examples of restoration projects across the West that have had multiple benefits um, for the local community and beyond. And we're going to start up in the Pacific Northwest in the coastal area of, um, of Southern Oregon. So in this, in this area, watershed restoration is an essential industry. Communities along the um, southern Oregon coast have long relied on rivers and waters flowing through their region for fishing, agriculture, for sustenance, and, and more recently, recreation. Over the last two decades, communities in the region um, completed a suite um, of restora watershed restoration projects, including you know, maintenance project, in-stream restoration, an upland restoration that helped to improve um, local infrastructure, uh, create, uh, they increased land productivity, um, revitalize local uh, local rivers and forests, and also were really significant job creators. The University of Oregon found that in the first decade of the 2000s, restoration, um, these restoration jobs, uh, restoration projects supported on average 73 local jobs per year. Um, and these restoration investments have resulted in more than $32 million in economic output um, on the southern coast as well. And most of these projects were funded by, um, by federal funding as well as state funding. Another example I want to share is much further south um, in the western United States in the community of Yuma, Arizona, along the Colorado River. Um, a grassroots initiative brought together um, local stakeholders, including the city, local tribes, and private landowners to restore a, a really seriously degraded habitat along the lower Colorado River. Um, since the project was, uh, was started in the year 2000, over 350 acres of wetlands and riparian areas have been restored, and the area was designated as the Yuma Crossing Natural Heritage Area. Um, the community leveraged over $8 million uh, in many different funding sources, federal, state, city, and tribal funding, um, and the project employed over 150 people. In addition to this awesome economic growth and, and the 
Um, and the jobs benefits. It also provided a number of other benefits. The project restored habitat for over 300 species of wildlife, and it provides really amazing recreational opportunities. An estimated, you know, 200 people a day visit um, the Yuma Crossing in the summertime. And then finally, we'll end where I live, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, urban communities can also significantly benefit from river restoration and revitalization um, projects. In Denver, city officials and local partners have worked, to, have worked together to restore the South Platte River and Cherry Creek, which flow right through the heart of downtown Denver. Um, these, uh, this initiative, these initiatives included riparian restoration, stream channel repair, floodplain reconnection, and the development of multiple greenways um, along, these, along the, both of, of these rivers, and, which I um, utilize all the time, and I know lots of people across Denver do. In 2017, um, Summit Economics evaluated the benefits of the years of restoration and found that on average, properties within a half mile of Denver, or sorry, of the river, um, hold a 36% higher property value than others in the city. And because of improved river conditions, Denver has collected an additional $64 million in property taxes. To achieve our goals of healthy um, communities, rivers, and economies, funding is needed to support um, the implementation of, of projects on the ground. In our report, we make the case that um, additional federal investment is needed to support water infrastructure improvements to modernize flood management and restore our watersheds. We, me we recommend that Congress um, invest over 10 years, $500 billion, to provide the funding that's truly needed to build our communities back stronger, um, help support our economies, and really make our, our watersheds more resilient. To bolster and improve the multiple benefit projects and solutions that we talk about in the report, um, funding should not only be prioritized to existing federal funding programs, but also we should create new funding buckets and grant programs that support and prioritize the implementation of the policy recommendations that we, that we provide, things like natural infrastructure. Um, in the appendix of the report, we provide a roadmap for how to do this. However, you know, federal funding is not the only source of public funding that's available. Restoration projects often utilize many different sources of funding, state, like state and local funding. Here in Colorado, the Colorado Water Conservation Board and Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, provide a number of different really important pots of funding for watershed um, and river restoration, like the Watershed Restoration Grants Program from the CWCB. And then at the local level, funding from conservation districts, open space programs, and other regional groups provide really critical funds um, that improve river health, access, and restoration opportunities. And I think it's finally important to note, um, and we'll hear a lot more about this in the other presentations and then in our discussion, you know, public funding isn't the only funding that's available for restoration projects. We'll hear more from, um, from Molly and Todd about funding opportunities with corporate, um, corporate sponsors and private capital, which can be leveraged with other public funding sources as well to come up with a really diverse um, funding sources for restoration projects. Finally, funding to support, you know, healthy rivers, watersheds, and communities is essential. As I said earlier, you know, this funding doesn't just come from one funding stream. It comes from a lot of different places, federal, state, local. Um, here in Colorado and in the West, you know, more broadly, I think we are acutely aware of the need for more funding to help protect and restore our rivers and ensure that there's enough clean, reliable water um, in the face of climate change and other challenges. In the past two years, uh, Coloradans have voted three times in support of new funding for river health. In 2019, voters passed Proposition DD, which legalized um, and taxed sports betting and dedicates proceeds to implement Colorado's water plan, which was signed um, by Governor, Governor Hickenlooper in 2015 and identifies a need for $100 million annually to achieve its objectives. And funding from DD is going to help to address this need. Then in 2020, Colorado voters continued to support healthy rivers um, in the Colorado River Water Conservation District and the St. Vrain Left Hand Water Conservancy District. And this, these two funding um, uh, uh, local ballot measures will raise an additional $8 million annually. Both of these measures, uh, these local measures passed overwhelmingly and in strong bipartisan fashion because of the collaborative approach um, 
that was developed to cultivate a broad coalition of supporters. The success of these measures shows how much Coloradans value healthy rivers and our water supplies for our environment, for our economy, and of course for our future. This new public funding will be available to support healthy rivers, productive agriculture, water quality, watershed health, infrastructure improvements, and conservation and efficiency. Um, on the West Slope, uh, the, the Colorado River District campaign secured endorsements from the most conservative to the most progressive communities and organizations, including agricultural producers, counties, cities, environmental groups, recreational interests, businesses, and individuals, demonstrating that the reliability and the quality of our water and the health of our rivers is a unifying issue. Overall, the passage of these three measures, Proposition DD and the two local measures this year, ensures at least $15 million a year in public funding will be generated to improve Colorado's river and ensure, our, and <clears throat> ensure a secure water future. This is a good start towards the full amount of funding that's needed to protect Colorado's rivers and reduce risk to the state's water supply by supporting a variety of projects like increasing river flows, improving conservation, restoring riparian areas, updating um, agri up outdated agricultural infrastructure, and mitigating forest fires. Today, more than ever, water unifies us by bringing together sometimes unexpected diverse interests to address the significant water challenges that we're facing. Collaboration is more important than ever, and by working together to identify and secure new sources of funding for healthy rivers and sustainable water, <clears throat> we're working to support a high quality um, of life for local communities, but working together to stimulate local economies and create jobs for Coloradans. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to my presentation and for joining the Restoration Economy panel. I look forward to discussing the importance of the Restoration Economy with Molly and Todd at the end of the session. Great. Thank you so much, Faye, for that. Um really informative overview. Um, I look forward to having our conversation towards the end of this session as well. Our next presenter, which we will launch um, right into, is uh, Molly Mugglestone. She is the Director of Communications and Colorado Policy at the Business for Water Stewardship, which is a project of the Bonneville Environmental Foundation. She will present their new report on economic contributions of river-related recreation in Colorado and the importance of adequate flows and healthy habitat to the state's economic well-being. Hi, my name is Molly Mugglestone and I am the Director of Communications and Colorado Policy for Business for Water Stewardship. And we are a organization that's based out of Bonneville Environmental Foundation in Portland, Oregon. I'm based in Colorado and I have a couple teammates um, that work with me in Colorado and then I also we also have a team in Arizona and um, today I'm going to be talking about our work with corporations on financing restoration and also um, thinking about the value of rivers and value of water. Um, at BWS uh, we work to secure water for business, nature, and communities and we do that through a, a number of different ways. Our consumer campaigns are our Change the Course program, and that works with corporations on raising awareness and, get, and engaging the business um, and their customers on water conservation. Um, an example of that is um, one of our biggest programs that we do is um, we partner with waste management um, on their efforts for conserving water and engaging people at the Phoenix Open, uh, which this year's just ended this weekend. Uh, we also have a number of on-the-ground projects that we work with corporations on funding. Uh, we work with businesses on um, policy and we work with decision makers and um, for everything from local, state, and federal, and we bring the business voice um, to those discussions. And then we have a number of events that we do throughout the year to engage businesses. We are a network of nearly 1,400 businesses working on sustainable water practices and policies and all towards the goal of healthy rivers. Um, we, these are just a couple of our stats around you know, what we are able to accomplish and who we work with. Um, 
and we um, engage with over 1,300 businesses, um, many NGO partners, and then we um, fund a lot of water projects. And then we, um, from those projects, are able to estimate the gallons of water that we've restored. And now it's about over 19 billion. We've done a couple of studies, and I wanted to highlight those in terms of the value, valuing water and valuing rivers. Um, this study was done with ASU, Arizona State University, a couple years ago, it was 2014. Um, but it looks at the overall value of the Colorado River system in the West to the economy. So the river system really provides um, the foundation for the, um, the business um, community and the things that we do in the West. Um, it is tied to over 16 million jobs in these states, and um, it produces around 100, or I'm sorry, 1.4 trillion dollars in economic output throughout all of the states, um, and that just really shows the um, the foundation that the river provides. Um, to then drives our economy in the West. We also just put out another study in Colorado specifically looking at water and river related recreation in the state of Colorado. Um, about 6.7 million people participate in, in, in some kind of river or water related recreation in the state every year. Um, and that um, activity um, brings around $19 billion in economic output. And in this study, we looked at things beyond just typical water recreation. So this is not just um, whitewater rafting and fishing. It does include those things. But it also includes things like um, bird watching and hiking and biking and all of the things that we like to do near um, or in rivers and waters and streams and lakes in our state. And, you know, without those river river and water and streams and lakes, um, we wouldn't have this economic output. Um, people would not be doing all of those things um, with, you know, limited water, um, dried up lakes, um, dried up streams, polluted streams. So this really does show the value of our water and our river systems in the state of Colorado. Um, and that's specifically to what people like to do um, around those waterways and then the money that they spend doing those things. So it also um, is, um, contributes to uh, over 130,000 jobs. People's jobs are related to this industry um, and brings in a lot of tax, billions of dollars in tax revenue to the state. So um, rivers are, are basically um, critical to our economies. And so that's the foundation that we build um, our, our work on, and that's why um, businesses care to, um, to work with us and to try to find solutions. Some of our partners are here. Um, we've worked with many kinds of businesses across the spectrum um, from our Change the Course campaign, like I mentioned, around um, community and employee and customer engagement um, to funding water restoration projects, which I'll talk more about today. Um, to coming with us to D.C. or meeting with governors to talk about water-related policies. We've got lots of different project types um, that span um, across the various needs that we find in, in the states that we work in, um, in terms of what's needed for the restoration projects. In Colorado, those um, projects have been around water quality improvements, um, enhancing recreation and economic um, areas, and then wildlife and habitat improvements. So those are the types of projects that we've really worked on in Colorado, um, with over 18 projects funded in the state of Colorado. Uh, the one that I wanted to highlight is um, the Colorado's 15-mile reach. Uh, we were just um, covered this story in Freshwater News, came out last December, talking about this project. And I'll just kind of read a little bit from the coverage to kind of talk about the project. So Coke Coors Seltzer Water Trust announced Colorado River Initiative. Um, and a coalition of high-profile businesses, including Coors Seltzer and Coca-Cola, as well as the nonprofit Colorado Water Trust, have signed up to add additional water for fish, farmers, and hydropower generation to a key segment of the drought-stressed Colorado River, known as the 15-mile reach. 
Um, my boss and our director, Todd Reeve, was quoted here as saying, companies are increasingly realizing the state of our water resources, and they're stepping up to support these environmental water solutions. And so we've raised nearly $100,000 so far um, to bring dollars to the project to, um, to make it happen. And we've worked primarily with um, Coors Seltzer, which has a great river um, project um, program going right now. Uh, Coca-Cola, which has um, many, many projects around water across the country and the world um, for water restoration and um, water health and river projects. Um, and then we've also worked with other companies. Um, Intel uh, was also involved with this um, as well as some others. So this is just one example of how uh, we work in collaboration to find sort of multi-benefit solutions to these really tough problems um, and bring, being able to bring corporate dollars to the table really adds um, a needed and additional um, aspect to a lot of the restoration projects um, that we hear about and that um, you hear about in the news and that we're hearing about in this conference. Um, and in this one, you know, it really did bring together um, the hydropower needs, um, the needs of the farmers, uh, the fish health that was suffering um, in this stretch of river, um, and then the dollars to really um, make it happen um, to be able to get water flowing in this stretch of river again. In Arizona, you can see our, our types of projects are, we're, we actually have done more in Arizona. <clears throat> we funded over 20 projects, um, everything from food and water security, <clears throat> excuse me, to sustainable agriculture, water quality again, water efficiency. Uh, we worked a lot with farmers in the state um, on um, crop, crop, different crops that are less water intensive. Um, and we've done a lot around um, Lake Mead. And that's um, <clears throat> where I'll talk about it in a minute. We've raised more than $4 million, and it's probably a lot more than that, actually, with our newest project. Um, it's probably over $6 million in the state of Arizona um, to go towards these types of projects. The one I want to highlight in Arizona is a pretty cool um, partnership. It's working with the Colorado River Indian tribes um, to um, get the state where they needed to be um, with their drought contingency planning and their system conservation um, requirements. And that's a, a long discussion I'm not going to go into, but basically Lake Mead is um, at low levels and our, you know, over almost 20 years of drought has really had an impact on Lake Mead. And the state of Arizona um, was tasked with finding solutions to um, making sure that we could bolster Lake Mead. So this investment that we were able to contribute to this process, um, we really worked with Fortune 500 global business leaders um, to really um, look at driving um, the sustainability of the water supply um, in Lake Mead and in the state of Arizona. And um, Arizona is a, a top destination for business investment. And so businesses really see the um, the dire need for water as um, a fundamental part of doing business in the state. And so this whole project really um, <clears throat> is around water security and really knowing that um, the water is going to be there in the future. And so um, we brought uh, 13, and we're still working with more corporate funders uh, to the table for this deal. Um, the money that we've raised, which is about almost $2 million now, um, compensates the tribe, the Colorado River Indian tribe. And then that money, um, it then cons uh, it goes towards conserving um, and putting um, 150 acre feet of the tribe's water into Lake Mead. Um, but it's sort of a lease of that water to from the Indian tribe. Um, the tribe has a lot of water rights, but isn't able to necessarily use all the water that they have. So a lot of the money that we're actually using supports the CRIT efforts to modernize their irrigation infrastructure and conserve additional water within their tribal system 
Um, and then the 158,000 acre feet is then um, leased out and um, they're not using it necessarily in, in the tribe. And so we're able to lease it out and it goes into Lake Mead. And this supports Arizona's commitment under the drought contingency planning. Um, and the reason that corporations are interested, like I said before, is just to really bolster up um, Lake Mead, which is the source of our water for the state of Arizona, um, and to just really contribute to that water security that is needed in Arizona um, for businesses to feel like they can still do business there. So some of the corporations we've worked with in, in Arizona on this project include Intel, Target, P&G, Cox Communications, um, and lots of different others. Um, so though those businesses are really showing leadership in um, being able to plan and think about the future of um, their business in the state of Arizona. And they want to stay in Arizona and do business and grow and hire, um, but they know that without um, a stable source of water, um, it's that's not going to happen. So we're really, really excited about the way that this whole collaboration has come together with meeting a need for the Colorado River Indian Tribe, supporting the drought contingency planning, um, and you know, supporting the economic um, impacts that we see in Arizona from a, from water. Um, so that's that's all I have. Um, I um, we can talk a little bit more in questions, or I can go into more depth. Um, but I think the main takeaway is. Um, just the fact that businesses are coming to the table. Um, they want to participate in water security. They want to participate in water policy and conversations. They want to help be part of the solution with public-private partnerships. Um, and really um, <clears throat> what we do is sort of negotiate the, the deals, if you will, to try to find what is interesting and, and important for the corporation itself and then what projects are out there in Arizona or Colorado or throughout the country um, to try to um, then direct those um, corporations to projects that are um, interesting for them and that meet their goals. Um, so it's not necessarily um, like money is just flowing in the doors, you know, and, and um, it's not going to solve our water funding problems, um, the corporate piece. But it's definitely um, a piece of the puzzle and a really, I think, interesting and important piece to really engage businesses and create leaders within the business community that can also um, not only bring in um, corporate funding, but can also come with us when we are looking at addressing drought policy. Um, and when we're looking at, um, for instance, dollars in federal infrastructure bills um, that could go to water water quality, water quantity, um, you know, safe drinking water, all of these things are critical to doing business anywhere. Um, and so being able to develop leaders within the business community um, for all of those reasons is, um, is what we do. So thanks so much for having me and I will stop there and um, I'm happy to answer questions later. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Molly, for your presentation. And I uh, that was just reviewed there that um, should give all of you some good opportunities to ask some key questions. I see some coming in already. Um, as we pull up the next presentation, uh, Molly, there was a question about whether you could provide a link or more information on the irrigation infrastructure projects and more sustainable crops in Arizona. So if you have that resource, um, that would be great if you could put it into the chat box. Um, okay, moving on to our next presentation, we will hear from Todd Gardner, who is the director of the Cities for Forests and National Infrastructure in Initiative at the World Resources Institute where he leads a multidisciplinary team with the mission to better conserve, manage, and restore forests, working landscapes, urban green infrastructure, and other ecosystems. Todd will be presenting on two proven strategies to successfully access private capital for natural infrastructure. Um, thank you to Todd for joining us today. And let's hear from him. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here, at least virtually. My name is Todd Gartner, and I am the Director of Natural Infrastructure and the Cities for Forest Initiative at the World Resources Institute. Uh, it's my pleasure to address you all today and talk about conservation finance, uh, how we find the sources of funds for green and gray infrastructure to protect our rivers and watersheds. Uh, and, and for me, um, you know, rivers and watersheds is a form of, of community. It's where I recreate. It's, it's where I get the greatest joy, whether I'm on a three-week paddle trip uh, down the, the Colorado River through the Grand uh, or in my own backyard in the Columbia River Gorge on the lower section of the, of the White Salmon. Um, it's just such an incredible asset uh, across the West. Um, and, and what I hope to, to cover uh, over the next 20 minutes is, is really some of the trends uh, around conservation finance, the sources and sequencing of funds and finance, uh, run through a couple of case studies where this has really been brought to bear and proven successful, and then we'll have a bit of a, a discussion session uh, at the end. Uh, and as incredible as those river systems are that make up our West, as everyone on the line knows there are some incredible challenges. Uh, drought and floods, land use change, uh, fires, climate change, and all of these things are, are piling on top of each other uh, while we have growing populations. Um, and the, the way that we've been thinking about addressing these problems over the last several decades needs to change. Uh, and, and for it to change, We've got to change the way that we invest in our natural, natural systems and the way that we think about funding and financing. And what I'd like to do is, is just start off by giving you know, a quick rundown of the various sources of funds and financing that are out there. These aren't kind of linear one after another all of the time, but they do generally come in this sequence. And uh, depending on what sector you might be in, I suspect most on the line are quite familiar with philanthropic and public dollars. Uh, these are most often oriented to get projects off the ground, do your due diligence and feasibility analysis. They may be coming from uh, corporate social responsibility, pools of dollars, local or, or national governments uh, and, and foundations. And that will continue to be an anchor in the conservation sector, in the rivers and, and watershed space for the foreseeable future. But we need to now think about how we leverage that with these you know, new forms of, of capital. And in the foundation space, one thing that you're starting to see is movement away purely from just grants to think about what's called a program-related investment. Uh, so these are investments with a repayment structure, but generally much less than a market rate investment. So as I'll talk about in one of my upcoming examples, the Forest Resilience Bond, a foundation like the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation providing a 1% loan uh, or a repayable grant. Um, the next sort of pool of dollars is where you often hear this idea of innovative finance and private capital. It's, it's green bonds, pay for performance, resilience bonds, you know, beneficiary pays principles, putting surcharges on your water bill. Uh, and that's, that's really where I'm going to focus most of the time today. Uh, all of this, the end game is to make this the new normal. Uh, to have green right there alongside the gray and that institutional investors uh, have this as part of their normal investment portfolio. So it's no longer just about impact, it's, it's just plain and simple investing. And everyone aligned is a believer, I suspect, in that natural systems are a key part of our uh, water security and livelihood agenda. Um, if we all know that, and, and you know, these projects have been talked about for quite some time, why have we not seen this get to the scale that we would all have hoped at this point? And, and there's a couple of reasons. One is um, many of these projects are not quote unquote investment ready. They're not of the right size. They don't have a particular return profile to investors. And those developing them maybe just haven't had that experience in that space. So you know, don't have the know-how, uh, the financial literacy um, to really get it to that level. And that's what we're trying to change here. 
Um, it, it's coming along, but the proof, right, that if you invest in watersheds, what is the quantifiable benefits that you will achieve in terms of volumetric benefits, sediment, uh, nutrient control, flood control, uh, we're getting better, uh, but success will continue to breed success. It's a generational thing as well, right? Um, it is um, at the universities, right? Getting this idea of natural infrastructure built into, uh, into the curriculum. Um, and as this idea of incorporating green and gray becomes more common, I think you're going to see even more experimentation, which will eventually get us to scale. And of course, we need to think about the, the benefits being recognized by all um, uh, people of color in lower income areas, uh, rural and urban. Um, for durable outcomes, we need to think about that, that cross-section of benefits. What I didn't mention is capital as a limiting factor. And if you work for a smaller nonprofit, you know, you may be always fundraising as, as part of my big, my perfect part of my job as well. But um, there is a lot of capital, what we call sitting on the sidelines, looking to be deployed. Um, there's been tons of surveys out there that investors have money earmarked for green stuff and they're not finding projects that are what they would call bankable or investment ready. Um, and and this, is, this is being proven out. Major commitments, major accelerator type programs from big banks and, 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 and federal governments um, saying we are launching programs to invest in natural capital. Now we've got to do a better job of playing matchmaker and connecting these projects uh, with the capital that is, that is out there. So the demand is there. Right. Uh, and now we're in a space of lowest interest rates in, you know, a very, very long time, um, you know, 2 percent in many cases. So it's a great time to think about, you know, this this new sources of, of, of funding and finance. And all of this is potential leverage and matching funds for you know, what we anticipate being a meaningful stimulus with infrastructure as a focus. Um, and, and most importantly, success breeds success. The more projects we can demonstrate hitting their priorities and goals and return profiles, the more likely we are to see replication and scaling. And I'm now going to work you through a couple of these successes. Um, and I mentioned before the idea of innovation, right? You hear that a lot, innovative capital, innovative finance. And, and um, it takes both innovation, but let's not ignore the boring, right? Financial markets like consistency, certainty, and sometimes the metric of success is if it's boring, then you know you've done your job because it's then part of the structure moving forward. Um, and what's more boring than debt, right? So the first example I'm going to give is, is about green bonds, which is a form of, of debt. And most utilities um, pay for their infrastructure with, with bonding, a form of debt. Um, and green bonds operate in much the same way as a traditional vanilla bond. Only the proceeds, right, the money that you are getting from the lender, uh, the proceeds are oriented for low carbon and environmental outcome. Um, and in order to get a green bond, to get a certified green bond, there is criteria and a scorecard that you work with a third party to make sure that the use of the proceeds does hit the mark in terms of that low carbon and, and green profile. There's some follow-up and validation, um, but usually it's a quite reasonable cost, which many people think might be a barrier. Um, but if you're issuing, you know, a $30, $50 million green bond, uh, you know, $20,000 uh, verification fee, um, we've heard time and again, will pay for itself. And, and I'll talk about that as well. You know, this idea of green bonds has really been taking off over the last, you know, five, eight years. Um, uh, but just recently, you know, one, it's crossed the $1 trillion mark, and we started to see it in the water space. Um, and this is both the, the gray side, so low carbon gray water infrastructure, uh, and the green side, um, watersheds, 
things of that nature, urban stormwater, green infrastructure. And the goal of the green bond is to make sure that these water outcomes are as real as possible. Think about it at the catchment level. Um, think about the use of the proceeds relative to alternatives, so that the GHGs are neutral or even lower than alternatives. And really importantly, thinks about how the infrastructure will hold up in the face of climate uncertainty, resiliency and adaptation ecologically ecologically and and socially. Um, and um, you've seen a lot of, uh, of experimentation in Europe, and now we're starting to see green bonds for natural infrastructure in the U.S. Beautiful photo of the watershed for Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, it is operated by Central Arkansas Water, a beautiful watershed that is under threat. Uh, over a third of the watershed is industrially managed. Uh, there is land use change happening, and uh, uh, Central Arkansas Water wants to understand how they can utilize innovative finance to protect and restore their watershed. So uh, the World Resources Institute, along with Encourage Capital and some of the funders you see at the bottom there, helped Little Rock and Central Arkansas issue the first ever green bond for forest protection and restoration by a water utility. So water quality was one of the primary desired outputs. Uh, it was over a $30 million issuance. A third of that went to forest protection and enhanced management. Two thirds went to traditional low carbon built infrastructure, uh, fixing pipes, things like that, which in, in, in the aggregate will reduce energy consumption. Um, there was a diversified base of investors that bid on the bond, and Morgan Stanley ended up paying a premium at just over 2% uh, for the bond, so quite successful. Basically, what this means, just like a mortgage, right? they're able to take the money from Morgan Stanley now, do their protection priorities, and then pay it back at 2%, just over 2% over a longer period of time. And that payback is happening through um, a, um, a, a number of different revenue sources. One, they have a rate surcharge specifically for watershed protection on their water bill that they're able to gradually increase every few years. They're looking at carbon credits um, and, of course, a sustainable timber management with practices that are, are really strong for, uh, for water quality. Um, and, and, and so, why are they doing this? And why are others thinking about green bonds in the water space? Well, as I mentioned, you diversify the investor base. A premium can be, can be realized in many cases. Enhanced communication, raising the profile, and really showing that you are doing the right thing for your constituents and, and the planet. When Central Arkansas Water issued this bond, they got coverage locally, nationally, globally, uh, from right and left-leaning periodicals in the finance space, in the environment space. Um, and so, again, $20,000, some staff time, but it more than paid for itself. The executive director of Central Arkansas Water, along with the, uh, the finance manager at um, San Francisco Public Utilities, up on the main stage at global platforms talking about what they're doing. Uh, the mayors had an opportunity to talk about this. So it has definitely served as a communication tool and raised the profile of their utility. And we're starting to see a number of other utilities uh, looking to replicate and contextualize for their own needs. What I'd like to do now is a slight shift from um, exciting but boring, uh, the traditional bond financing, to something slightly more innovative. It's the Forest Resilience Bond that WRI uh, has developed with the lead developer, Blue Forest Conservation. Uh, and it's, it's there to address um, arguably the biggest environmental issue across the West, fire. No matter where you are, you're feeling it. I live west of the Cascades in, in Oregon, and uh, for a week and a half, um, you know, I had an air purifier running nonstop, and my dogs and I were, were, were stuck inside. Um, and when you think about the level of infrastructure and human well-being at risk uh, from catastrophic wildfire risk, you know, it's scary, and it's only going to get worse. Um, and, and there's many reasons, right? Climate change, uh, the drought, um, more people in, in natural systems, so the likelihood of fire starting um, is increasing. But we do know that our forest conditions are a big part of it, right? If we look at how things have changed over the last 100 years, it is quite dramatic. 
We also know, though there's no silver bullet, forest restoration, forest health treatments are a valuable tool to reduce that catastrophic wildfire risk and therefore reduce the risk to our infrastructure and our water systems. The forest resilience bond does have some similarities to a traditional bond in that investors are involved in the front end. They provide the upfront money to basically a middleman uh, who serves to work with both the lenders and those who are going to be paying back. Uh, once the money is received from the investors, it goes to an implementation partner, the men and women on the ground with the chainsaws, uh, with, with, um, uh, with the other equipment, providing forest health treatments on the ground. Once that work is done, obviously the benefits are provided, the risks are reduced, and beneficiaries like water and hydroelectric utilities, state agencies, then pay back the investors through the middleman. And uh, I'd like to work you through a, a quick example to show you what that looks like in practice, uh, the Yuba project, uh, which we launched in late 2018, North Yuba River watershed in the Tahoe National Forest. It's 150,000 acre watershed. We focused on 10%, so about 15,000 acres where we did restoration across that area, just over a $4 million project. Uh, and we had two types of investors giving money up front, market rate investors who were getting 4% return per annum. And then, as I mentioned before, those program related investments. Uh, so those are our concessionary um, um, investments, a 1% per annum return. Um, and so how this works is those investors on the left side, at least the way I'm looking at it, uh, Rockefeller and Moore, 1% investment, uh, Calvert Impact and AAA Insurance, 4%. Each one of them gave a million dollars. It goes to the, uh, the special purpose vehicle, which is the Forest Resilience Bond. The Forest Resilience Bond then gives that money in a, um, a scheduled approach to the National Forest Foundation, who hires the contractors to go in and do forest thinning, uh, meadow restoration, aspen restoration, um, a riparian enhancement, and the like. Um, once that work is done, the investors get paid back. Uh, the Yuba Water Agency, which is a water supply company, a hydroelectric facility, uh, they uh, provided uh, part of the repayment. The state of California, through a number of the water and climate bonding authorities uh, and grant programs, uh, paid back in the Forest Service through uh, planning and, and oversight provided in-kind contributions. Uh, and real benefits are being realized. So we're in year two of implementation at this point, and, and some of the numbers that you see on the screen are what help make the case to the utility and to the state, and really to the investors, that this was a return on investment proposition, right? Nearly $9 million of expected return just in this 15,000 acre area in terms of, of um, energy and water uh, benefits as well as benefits to the local economy. Uh, it's a pilot, um, but our goal is to move, uh, um, so the first project was 15,000 acres. We're hoping by the end of 2021 to launch the second project in the same watershed for double the size. So at least 30,000 acres, and we expect that to be somewhere in a, a 12 to $18 million project. Um, a number of other projects in California, as well as in Oregon and Washington, potentially Arizona and Utah. Um, all of these are starting to take shape. And because of the scale of the problem, uh, we need a solution that scales in private finance. Uh, again, no silver bullets, but it will help us get there bigger, better, faster. One of the really important things which will help you diversify your investor base and your beneficiary base, those who are paying investors back, is being able to quantify the benefits, being able to tie them to whatever priorities that entity may have to the sustainable development goals. Uh, and what we often do, not often, what we do do uh, with both the green bonds and the forest resilience bond is come out with a annual impact report. This is the work that was done, the acres, the communities benefited, you know, the, 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 as, as quantifiable as possible, what the benefits were on, on greenhouse gases, nutrients, volumetric water, um, and of course that means detailed monitoring. And in all of these cases we are triangulating satellite imagery, looking at 
um, you know, on the ground gauges, even thinking about how there's you know, community monitoring of science, all of these things to collect data, to adapt our projects to be as beneficial as possible, and to have more successful proof points so that we can see this replicated and contextualized in other places across the country and really across the world. So with that, um, I know that was a lot, and for many of you this may be a somewhat new concept, don't worry. Um, I'm happy to, to have conversations with any and all of you in more detail uh, about how we did this, what we did, and most importantly, what it might mean for your watershed. So I look forward to the discussion section, and uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Todd. I am going to invite our presenters to um, turn on their videos and unmute themselves as we have our conversation. Oh, let's see here. Do I'm setting here. Um, so obviously that was a lot of information that we captured in a mere hour. Um, and I know there are probably a fair number of questions about some of the mechanics of some of these financing uh, mechanisms. Um, but I'd like to answer the questions that came into our um, chat box first so we get a chance to um, hear from our audience. Um, and so we'll go through those first. And then I have some questions of my own that um, I will ask to prompt conversation. Um, firstly, can you guys hear me all right? OK, super. So the first question I saw was, uh, kudos to companies for investing in restoration and water conservation. You detailed a local project where the company was invested in the community. I'm concerned when corporations invest in showy or national initiatives before their own watersheds, how do, we pro how do you propose we inspire them to invest in their home waters? I think that's largely for you, Molly. Sure. Um, what we find, and this is not my um, boss, Todd Reeve, is the one that runs the program for B BWS and DEF. Um, so this is not my day-to-day -day work, so I'm going to do my best in answering these questions. Um, but my understanding in our work with these, um, putting the deals together, if you, if you want to call it that, finding, matching, a corporation's desire to have a water sustainability, a corporate water sustainability program with the projects that are out there um, is kind of where we fit. So we work with, we always work with an on the ground uh, uh, organization. So in Colorado, for example, it's the Colorado Water Trust, it's T and, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Trout Unlimited, and those are the people that are on the ground really and all of you learning and understanding and knowing the ins and outs of what um, what projects are, are out there. And then it's our job to match the money. And a lot of times those dollars come, they come without uh, specifics. So a lot of times companies will just say to us, we really want to invest um, in um, in, in, in an area, they, they can be specific uh, or general. Um, a, lot of, like, a lot of times they'll be open to what's the most need, and so that's where we can come in and say, well, this is a really important project, like the 15-mile project that I talked about. Um, all four of those companies that contributed to that, it, it's not like they sort of knew about the 15-mile project beforehand and said, hey, we really want to fund this necessarily. It was really the opposite of that, where we said, this is a really important project, um, and we hope that you know, if you want to invest in the state of Colorado, for example, um, this would be a great one to, to invest in. So a lot of times, it's our, uh, our council. Other times, though, they do, some companies will be very specific. So um, Microsoft and Intel, for example, in Arizona, they have major data centers and um, massive water consumptive projects in the specific areas that they are actually working in. And these are like multi-global corporations. So I would, I would suggest that there isn't really one place, for, for example, that Intel, you know, lives. They live everywhere. Um, they live in all of our phones. <laughs> um, but, you know, in terms of their, their um, water intensive 
places that they that they choose to operate, uh, they are very much contributing to those local communities and seeing specific the one I know the most about and I was able to visit is um, in a, in um, in Arizona where Intel has built a major plant worked with the city worked with the water managers in that area and said we know we're going to be very water intensive we know it takes a lot of water to do what we do um, and we want to do everything we can um, to give back to the community to um, use you know Intel's a very good example of a company that uses their every single drop down to the you know molecules within the water and I got to tour the plant and see the like leftover brine I mean they are taking every single thing out um, of the of the droplets of water that they possibly can and so that is a great example of um, a company that says look we know we need social license to operate in this place we know we're coming in um, we know we're going to be, you know, somewhat disruptive, if you will, or be at least be a very big water user, and we want to um, make sure that we're not only contributing to at the best efficiency and conservation that we can in our plant, but also um, use some of our um, dollars to pay for some of the water restoration projects. And then um, I know that there was another question, and I did stick it in the chat box. Um, we actually work. Um, we have a partnership with the River Network. So our project bank is massive, and you can kind of go through and see all of the different projects throughout the country. And so, I, and then I just pulled one out from Arizona, which is a, probably one of our best sort of irrigated ag examples down in the Birdie River region. And there's actually three or four. I was just looking at it um, in that project bank, and I stuck one of those links into the chat box as well. So um, those are all there to, to see, too. Thanks, Molly. Um, one sure. thing that I have observed in my interactions with corporations is also that um, there's a strong case to be made for the um, quality of life for the employees and the employer retention piece and investing in their own um, watersheds and um, communities is often a big incentive for those companies that can afford to do so. And so making that selling point can also be um, important and work well when having those types of conversations. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we actually we actually do a lot in our policy work um, where we will bring a corporation that has located in place um, for that reason and then talk to the governor or legislators in Colorado, for example. This is a major talking point for us in our policy work around um, you know, these watersheds and these um, rivers th that go through our communities need to be protected. We need to have um, the policy work we do goes a step further because it's it's a lot more detailed than than writing a check and, you know, and, and giving money to restoration. Um, but a lot of companies, that's kind of our, our model is we have sort of this ladder of engagement where we'll bring a company in at whatever level that they're interested or comfortable with. Um, and try to build them into advocates um, because those are the places where we can actually see, um, you know, in legislation and, and as Faye was talking about and, you know, in terms of the funding mechanism, we, we brought a lot of businesses to um, the 7A campaign and the DD campaign because they can see um, down the line, you know, not just for their own security of like, are, am I going to be able to turn the tap on and run my business, but also, Am I going to be able to recruit and retain customer um, employees um, if I'm going to do business in these places? And that's we see that happening all over the West for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question I see is, what's the first step in creating a green bond, and then following steps? So, Todd, that sounds like that's uh, one for you to field. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, so. Um, First step is to sending me an email, um, but but and then I'll help direct you to. So we work most closely. There's a number of different green bond certification programs that are out there. Um, the one that we feel is most robust and that we recommend is through the Climate Bonds Initiative, who works across sectors. Um, in the water space, we've developed a a, a step by step guidance document for utilities and their partners 
um, to begin working through the process of, of putting together the green bond package. Um, um, sometimes there is a little bit of additional modeling that is needed, um, thinking about how the project level use of the proceeds connects to the larger catchment level priorities. Um, but a lot of it is really pulling together often disparate information that maybe isn't publicly available and sort of systematically putting it in place so that it's clear um, any sort of environmental or social trade-offs are being understood and accounted for, um, that there's clarity around uh, how the payback would occur, right? What revenue streams would become available to pay investors back over time. Um, it, it, this is something interesting with like DC water and with San Francisco public utility commissions, huge utilities. Um, you know, neither one, they all had plans around adaptation and resilience, um, but it wasn't sort of articulated in a way that it could easily be shared and communicated with their boards, with their customer base and with partners. And, and the green bond process really forced them, uh, a better way to say it is help them uh, develop those materials into communication materials, which has been a, a, a huge benefit to them uh, since that point in time. Um, just in terms of how long it takes, right? Like, you know, how much does, how much does it cost and how long does it take? Usually it's about $20,000 to go through the entire certification process. That's both on the front end, that, that covers the upfront costs of, of getting certified and verified. And then also within the first two years, basically an audit of sorts to go back and make sure that the issuing entity, usually utility, is spending the proceeds in the way that they were intended. Life happens, COVID occurs, things change. Um, you, it then gives you some flexibility to, to say, we said we were going to do X, we ended up doing Y, here's, here's what and why we did that. Um, and then in terms of, of the time it takes, uh, the example that I discussed with Little Rock, uh, in less than a month, we were able sort of soup to nuts, put everything together um, with probably about a third time of, of one staff member at the utility and about a third time of someone on, on my team. Um, and maybe just while I have the mic, just to add on something Molly said about the corporate um, engagement side, something that you're really seeing more and more is um, quantifiable targets that companies are setting using science-based targets or contextual-based targets that are intended to be specific to the watersheds where they're operating. And so as those on the line are thinking about, you know, how do we work with uh, an Andrew Bush InBev or a Microsoft or, or other companies, you know, look at what their, their targets are in terms of replenishment, right? If they can't account for all of their water use efficiency within the plant and they're looking to the watershed, first and foremost, they're often going to be looking at quantifiable volumetric water targets, um, allocation targets, and, and water quality. So the more you can align your projects and speak the same language, right? Um, the same accounting metrics, the more likely you are to be able to attract their investment and, and the uh, needs joint priorities. Thanks. Yeah, I think that speaks to um, one of the questions or one of the topics that came up during your presentation about scaling and trying to identify products and how to scale them appropriately and developing and cultivating that, um, that savvy, I guess. Um, so that uh, practitioners can better understand how to package the work that they're doing in such a way that it is appealing to investors. Um, I think probably each of you can kind of speak to some of that in, uh, from the different perspectives of the various investors that you work with. Um, let's see, is my audio still working? Okay, great. Um, we had another question that was, why aren't the beneficiaries willing to be the investors? Um, so that's a pretty um, broad question. I don't know if any of you have thoughts or input. Um, Faye, I'm not sure um, if you have any reactions to that or want to add anything to the conversation that we've had so far. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to add in some things, and I feel like Todd prob um, probably also has some pieces there on the on the 
private capital side. Um, but I think, you know, in a lot of cases, beneficiaries are willing to be the investors. I mean, I think when, um, you know, when you think about um, public funding, for example, you know, whether it's the federal government or state government or local government, if they're providing a grant, um, they are therefore investing in the project and they will, you know, receive some sort of benefit, um, obviously, from, um, from their investment, whether it's you know, improved habitat or recreation opportunities, which obviously then have those kind of ancillary benefits, um, economic benefits that help to improve, you know, their communities and the overall state's kind of quality of life. And and to the points that Molly and Todd were making earlier that you were making about, you know, keeping people in those areas. So I think that there's definitely, um, from the public side, there's, there is a big kind of investment component, um, that the investors benefit from from their funding and then I don't I'll I think Todd should speak to this more but you know from my understanding on the private side there are a number of um, when it comes to some of the more innovative financing techniques there are um, investors that or, or sorry um, beneficiaries that are also investors so I know there's um, a project in Colorado that is kind of in the process of being developed or um, by Quantified Ventures. Um, they're another group that kind of works on environmental impact funds. And, um, you know, their, their Southwest Colorado, the, it's called the Southwest Colorado Wildfire Mitigation Impact Fund, um, does kind of focus on and work with um, beneficiary beneficiaries who basically would then sort of like kind of repay this revolving loan um, from the fund based on various risk outcomes. So I do think, you know, that's, not, again, that's not my area of expertise as much, but Todd can probably expand a bit more on kind of how that, that repayment structure um, often works. Yeah, Faye, well, well said, Faye. And, and part of it is, is nomenclature. Um, and, and we intentionally try to um, distinguish between investors, which is outside money, right, from anybody, anywhere, right, in the cases that I described, you know, Calvert Impact Investors, AAA Insurance, Rockefeller Foundation, they're putting money in up front, just like whoever holds your mortgage is putting in the money up front, and they have the, the deep pockets to be able to do that. Um, the benefit, and, and for them, that return on the investment is the payments that they get every quarter, right? And, and so either a 1% or a 4% return. So as an investor, that's how they're looking at the proposition and they look at the credit worthiness of those that are gonna be paying them back. Again, a lot of parallels when you go through a credit check for your, for your mortgage. Um, the beneficiaries um, wouldn't need investors if they had just as deep of pockets, right? But they don't, right? So they're willing, they need the work done now so they borrow the money. Um, and for them, that return on investment is by, by contributing to the natural infrastructure restoration or conservation, um, the Yuba Water Agency spent $1.5 million and got $8 million of benefits. So it's a, a different but equally as valuable return on investment calculation. So in the cases that I described, the beneficiaries are paying back the investors Right, but they're all sort of contributing towards the on the ground outcomes. Great. Did you want to add anything, Molly? Okay. Um, another question that came in is the companies, businesses, etc., that you all work with that are consuming water, are they also pushing local water management entities to cap water demand in some form so that water saved by conservation? by one water user does not simply get gobbled up by another thirsty water user. So how do you ensure that it actually goes to the intended purpose of conservation? Sure. I think um, a lot of the times the businesses and corporations that we work with, um, like I kind of mentioned earlier, they're ready to go up that ladder of engagement and go into advocacy, which I think is what this question is getting at, it's basically um, the, the other side of this coin, which is uh, how are we managing our water? How are we conserving our water in it, you know, whether it's local 
uh, water agencies or at, you know, state levels or even policies coming from the feds. So we do definitely see uh, many more companies becoming more uh, just aware of beyond kind of the four walls of what, you know, what they're doing themselves. Um, again, it's, it's being, uh, having that social license to operate within a, in a place, right? If you're doing something in a place and you're taking a resource in that place, um, you should be a good corporate partner, a, go, a good corporate citizen. And I think corporations are, are managing that way much more, um, than they used to. And, and then also seeing the, the, the bigger picture that the question asks, which is, um, how can we affect policies and um, laws and, and um, conservation, uh, you know, concepts in the places that we're operating and, and really make those arguments. And, I mean, one of the reasons my organization was formed was really to bring businesses into those kinds of conversations because, Oftentimes, they're really not participating in any of the conversations. They might just pay the water bill, and it might be very large in places but where they're operating, but they're not necessarily coming to the water meetings or having the conversations or having the relationships with the water districts or the state that they're operating in. And so we really try to be that conduit to bring in so, you know, a lot of times it is actually the company's um, own conservation and efficiency measures, like I was talking about Intel, like they now go to Governor Ducey in Arizona and say, look, you know, we're doing a lot of work to maximize this resource and we want to see state policies that are going to encourage that throughout. Um, and, you know, the governor listens to Intel when, he's, when they come and talk to him. So that, I think it's a really, really powerful tool um, in our toolbox that we, that we use for sure and, and really try to emulate. Um, we want to do more of like the B2B, the business to business um, concept. We've tried some conferences in the past. They're just massive and even, you know, you guys are doing an awesome job with the online conference, but um, with the pandemic and everything too, like it's hard to, um, to do and, and kudos to you guys for doing such a good job pulling this off um, and I've been to a lot of really good conferences actually over the pandemic it's kind of cool to see how we're all pivoting but, but um, we have tried that in the past we haven't done one recently um, where we try to get um, businesses together in the same room so that they can learn from each other um, in terms of um, you know more like within the four walls you know what are you doing what are you instituting what kind of innovations are you using um, you know in your water in your water space so thank you um, we have one more question that I see from Carrie um, which is kind of a more um, kind of one-on-one on some of these financing mechanisms, but it's relating to what are sustainability bonds, social bonds, and pay for success? So kind of some of what I think you covered, Todd. Yeah, um, and, and again, it's sort of a category of um, environmental or social impact bonds is sort of the broad umbrella category. And then under that, you see green bonds and climate bonds, um, you know, the one that I think truly is a little bit unique is the pay for performance um, in that those are designed um, for projects that truly have the ability to quantify the environmental or the social outcomes at a really granular level. Uh, and oftentimes the ability to deliver on those outcomes above a certain agreed upon threshold can impact interest rates. So maybe just a, a 30 second example of what that means. DC Water, uh, two ish years ago, issued a, a pay for performance or a pay for success uh, bond with Morgan Stanley, um, looking at the use of green infrastructure to deal with urban stormwater. Um, and um, there were some regulatory drivers behind it. Um, they, they did, the, they did the, the bond at a pilot level, and um, um, 
what they agreed is they did the modeling beforehand and they said, if we do the green infrastructure and it works within this 90% confidence interval in terms of stormwater management benefits, we'll pay 3.5% interest rate. If it underperforms, then we are actually going to pay a lower interest rate, which seems a little bit counterintuitive, right? If it underperforms, why are you paying lower? Because if it underperforms, that means that they can't fully scale the green infrastructure and have to default to gray infrastructure, which costs many, many tens of millions of dollars more. If the, if the green infrastructure overperforms, then they actually pay a higher interest rate and it will kick in the full scale green infrastructure project, which in aggregate will actually save the utility a lot of monies. Um, and so this is something that is, is somewhat new in the space. It's not for all projects, um, but it really does try to entice the utility and their partners to um, monitor and collect the data around the impacts of the green intervention uh, as much as possible, which is ultimately what we want to do. We don't want to just say it's clean water, we want to say X reduction in nitrogen, X reduction in, in flood risk. Thanks. Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. Does anyone have anything to add on that? Okay. Um, uh, another question that just came in from Laura is, do you find that investors try to control the restoration process or even the publicity of the project? Um, I could see that being um, directly related to some of what Molly covered. Um, maybe even some of what Faye covered. Do you want to take a turn, one of you? Sure, I can speak to it quickly and then see Faye and Todd. Um, no. <laughs> the, the, the simple answer is no. Um, so the interesting thing about this work is that it kind of gets back to what you were saying, Todd, earlier about um, corporate water goals and replenish goals. So. Um, most of the time, the big companies, we're talking the large corporations, they have these really um, audacious goals um, of, you know, replenishing all the water they take in the watersheds that they work in, um, and not necessarily one-to-one, -one, kind of like a question earlier, like if they're not necessarily saying we're going to replenish all this water here, they just make large goals, like we're going to replenish all the water we use um, by 20. 20, it was, was was an Intel goal that they that they met. Um, and so to them, it is, and this is, you know, I mean, we want to think that this is coming from um, a place of, um, you know, wanting to do good, and some of it, some of it is, but the reality also is um, that these larger corporations are trying to meet their replenish goals. And the bigger the corporation, the, the bigger, the, the sort of further away almost that you get from, um, from the, you know, from the project, really. Um, so we actually have the opposite problem. And a lot of the times we um, want to engage and, you know, use the business's voice and get quotes and, and you know, get some of these um, business um executives on, on camera and talking about this and, you know, and some of them are really, really good. Um, John Radke, for instance, from Coca-Cola, I mean, they have a specific water replenish um, department. It's small, um, but they actually have someone at Coca-Cola that that's, that's what John Radke does every day. He thinks about water. And so, um, but in a lot of these companies, they really don't even have um, a person necessarily dedicated to this. It's really just, um, you know, their CSR, their corporate social responsibility people, um, you know, assessing, uh, assessing where they can do their replenish projects and, and where they can, um, you, know, have, you know, put those dollars. To, and then that's kind of where we come in, too, because as the deal makers, we're then, like I said earlier, we're then able to say, well, this... Um, this project is really high priority for us, um, and you'll really you'll, repl you'll you'll get lots of you know the replenishment um, gallons in this particular project. It's really hard actually to do that matchmaking um, because as much as there's a need, there's also um, you know just like I guess 
part of my point is that, you know, some companies will say, well, I, I, I really do want to work in Colorado or I really do, I don't want to work in Colorado and I do want to work in Arizona. Um, and so, you know, just that's like our role is to just sort of do the, do the deal making and finding the projects. But um, uh, most of the time it is not, they are not involved at all with, um, they probably couldn't tell you <laughs> very much about um, the projects. Um, and, you know, it's somewhat unfortunate, but it's also just kind of the reality of how corporation, you know, how the corporate world works. And um, we're just really, you know, I think it's also evolving. I think um, as we, as companies start to understand water risk more um, and, and the, the drought effects of doing business in the West, for instance, or, or anywhere where there's water issues, kind of like Faye was talking about in terms of, I mean, you can have too little water, you can have too much water, you can have um, flooding, you, you all of these sort of risks involved around water. I think as more companies sort of understand um, those risks, they're going to get more involved. But at this point, um, it is much more of a sort of transactional relationship than, than a real emotional one, if you will. That's interesting. Um, so kind of to take a step back and think um, across the presentations that each of you gave, um, you each spoke about a different type of investor, uh, a public, corporate, private, and I'd like to hear from you all on ways that natural resource managers might be able to better leverage these different and diverse funding sources across the different um, investment types to better protect rivers, if you've given that some thought. I'm happy to start since public funding was the first thing we talked about. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think there is a lot of opportunity to think through how we can leverage the different financing tools to protect and restore rivers. So, you know, for me, one of the key ways that I think when I think about kind of leveraging um, funding is, is relationship development and relationship development with various stakeholders. Um, and that means people who are not only the stakeholders that are kind of normally in, you know, the water sphere or the river sector, um, but also those that aren't. And I think, you know, by developing those relationships, particularly those entities that either are potential investors or funders or beneficiaries of the beneficiaries of the project, you can really create um, really diverse support for projects, which obviously then helps to attract additional funding and dollars either to your project or kind of subsequent projects, which I think is really important. Um, you know, and I think when, like for going back to the, the 7A um, kind of uh, the campaigns in, in Colorado this past fall, you know, one of the big successes of, that, of those campaigns was the development of diverse coalitions and the fact that there were so many different entities that kind of came together to support these public funding measures um, and, and raise that capital or that, that funding that will then be available for all sorts of different, you know, river and water related projects to apply for. Um, and, you know, those, those dollars that are available now can be leveraged with other existing public funding sources or other sources of funding as well, kind of expanding the impact, which I think is really um, critical and important. And I think, you know, when we, when we think about like this value chain that's associated with natural infrastructure or river related projects, you know, identifying and bringing in, you know, new sources of revenue is really important and thinking about it from like, the beneficiary side, like who could we talk to that benefits from these projects that might be interested in investing or supporting or helping um, to kind of, again, grow the impact of that project. Yeah, and, and just to add to that thought, in listening to the Colorado River District's plans for how that funding will be spent, ensuring that there is cash match and there is buy-in by all of the folks that are submitting proposals for those projects. Um, seems to be a very practical way that they are trying to leverage other and more diverse funding streams to that. So using that coalition to rally public support for a certain type of funding stream to be made available and then using that as a key stream of um, leverage for other funding to be brought to the table. Yep, exactly. 
Do you have any thoughts that you want to add, Todd or Molly? Go ahead, Todd. I, mean, I think you said it really well with the leverage piece. Um, you know, that, that one of the first slides I gave that sort of talked about the sequencing of capital. Both of the projects I described in Little Rock and in Northern California, um, philanthropic and or public dollars was key to get it started, to form the coalitions, to do a lot of the analysis that then set the table to attract corporate dollars which allowed it to sort of grow in size um, and an eventual impact, which then set the stage to tap into private capital. Almost never do you start with private capital. Um, you really often need, you know, you got you to crawl before you walk, before you run, and private capital is generally only interested in deals that are, you know, medium-sized, seven figures and above. So um, that, that sequencing thing um, and the leverage is really key, and especially the corporate sector. Um, can't speak for all of them, but they like to know that they're leveraging state money, federal money, other companies at the table. And, and then the story of all of those consortiums, all those partners coming together towards the same goal. Someone asked about, do they control the story? Um, you know, hopefully we're all telling the same story at the end because it's been successful and there's been so many different hands in the pot. So. Yeah, yeah I would, I would just add that our, Colorado River Indian Tribes and System Conservation Project is a perfect example of that because basically the state of Arizona had to meet this goal of $8 million raised to um, uh, to buy water to put into Lake Mead. And um, the corporations basically stepped in um, to, to work towards that goal. Um, partly, like you said, Todd, like as sort of this partnership, and I think, you know, sort of both sides of that saw the leverage points and the reasons why, you know, the reasons to contribute. Um, and obviously the state was thrilled <laughs> that there was corporate interest in um, trying to fill Lake Mead. Um, it's, you know, and that one I think is so straightforward. I think it gets a little more complicated um, it, it's actually harder to raise corporate dollars in Colorado for us than it is in Arizona because the threat is so much more um, immediate in Arizona. I don't think Colorado companies necessarily see the threat, um, and so they're not coming as quickly to the table to, to put dollars towards the solutions. And we also, I think, ch are challenged sometimes with, I mean, there's so much need out there, but it's also really hard, I think, to get to the point where you were just saying, Todd, of like having the project ready. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's lots of conceptual stuff out there. Um, and that's, I guess, probably where, where we rely more on the public sector and, um, you know, the Colorado Water Conservation Board, for instance, to, to do a water restoration grant like you said, Todd, and then you can kind of see the corporation being like, okay, like I get this now, like I understand what it is, um, and I see how it's going to get me to my goals, um, and then, you know, and then you said, you know, then sometimes you get the investing piece on top of that, but it really kind of has to, everything has to come together the right way, and corporations have to see, you know, a need. They really do need to see, um, the you know the the reason for it's different than investing because it's not really ROI but you know they they definitely need to see how it can help them reach their goals and so um, it's it's just a really interesting challenge and it's completely different in every single place that you that we work um, across the country. Yeah, I mean this is a bit of a speculation, but it's that's an interesting observation in the sense that um, I know CWCB is a very active public funder in the state of Colorado, and perhaps having that active state agency um, offsets the urgency for um, corporate funders to get involved um, or for uh, natural resource managers to seek out that funding in the same way. So um, the landscape of funding is obviously key to to that investment. Well, we are at time. I, mean, I would say, to... though, I mean, I would add to that, though, like, I mean, we have $100 million a year that we have to raise to fund the water plan. 
Um, but like telling those stories to corporations and helping them understand what am I buying? Like, what am I getting for that? You know, and I, so I don't necessarily, I mean, there's not, I mean, CWC, yeah, yeah they, they do have a grant program, um, but uh, it's, I think it's just, they're, they're, you know, I mean, the legislature is giving like, what, $10 million a year, let's say, to this $100 million price tag. And so that's what Faye and I work on together a lot, like, is how do we fill the gap? And um, how do we, and my job then is to talk about, you know, how do we make that gap um, analysis interesting to investors or, or corporations? Um, what's going to make them want to come to the table? What's going to be interesting or valuable to them? And again, I think it's, um, it's just a lot easier when you're in a state that is not a headwater state. <laughs> because we have the water in the state, obviously it's very complicated, um, but you know, a company is not gonna, in Colorado is not going to face the same sort of risk as they are in an Arizona. And so, um, but we definitely have the price tag here. We just, it's our challenge to figure out how, how to fill the gap. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, that's a very important point. Um, we have one more question in the chat box. Um, we are at time, but I'm going to see if we can squeeze in a response to this. Um, the question is, how is deal making complicated with water rights? What is the incentive for a potential investor who owns substantial rights to go beyond the status quo? Um, you might need to refer to a specific case study to be able to speak to this, but I'll, I'll sounds like some of you might have some responses. I'm happy to take a stab. And in some ways, it, it references an earlier question about, you know, if you do great work, how do you make sure others in the watershed aren't simply, you know, undoing it in one way or another? And, and um, you know, in, in California, for example, the utility is quite interested in, in modeling and monetizing the additional water availability. Uh, for them, you know, Northern California with the geology, you remove trees, change the evapotranspiration, it'll turn into runoff, more energy sales for hydroelectric and more, more water sales. Uh, there, and because of the water rights situation, for them it's not a problem. Areas in the front range, very similar conversation if you have the utility say, don't talk about water quantity, it complicates our life. Um, so being a little bit general there, but the bottom line to your question, it, it does really complicate things. Um, especially when you're dealing with water rights that, you know, just don't make sense anymore in the current urbanized environment. So it's definitely something to think about. And oftentimes you need legal assistance to understand the implications if additional water quantity is likely to be recognized through these natural infrastructure interventions. That's why Colorado has the most water lawyers. <laughs> well, I, I, I would, I, I was just going to, oh, sorry. I was just going to add to, it's a little bit of a different take on that question, but um, some of the work that Faye and I work on together around um, some of these issues of more of like a leasing strategy um, as we look to like demand management and how are we going to, you know, fill the gaps in our supply and demand um, problems. Um, and, you know, rather than like purchasing water rights, there's lots of, um, we don't have time here to go into it, but lots of sort of um, case studies that are out there that look at um, how can we, you know, pay a, um, a, a farmer, for instance, or somebody who owns a water right to lease that water um, for a certain amount of time in that that can kind of um, dilute this problem of like buy and dry where we're not necessarily buying those water rights, but if they're not being, you know, if a farmer can um, lease some of their water that isn't being used, um, can that then be used for river health um, and flow restoration and, and all the things that we've been talking about. So definitely a, a topic of conversation that's happening very much in Colorado right now and um, much more complicated than that, but and I don't know, Faye, if you want to um, come in, but I think that's one area that um, we are seeing 
um, some just, you know, some sort of trying to just get creative with um, without getting to a sort of buy and dry situation, which is not what, what anybody wants. Well, thank you all. Um, I feel like we could probably talk for another hour because this is pretty fascinating stuff and it's definitely uh, the future of how we're going to um, finance river and watershed health and protection and concert water conservation. So um, I'm really excited that you all were able to participate. I thank you for your time.